Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Isabelle Vaillant, who has been generous enough to give us time out of her busy schedule. While it's unfortunate that she is not able to join us here in person for obvious reasons, we are nonetheless delighted that she has agreed to speak to us today via a webinar. Isabel will speak for around 10 minutes with introductory remarks, and that will give us plenty of time for a Q&A session. The event today will be slightly shorter than our usual one hour events. Uh, you are very welcome to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send your questions and your comments and your thoughts th throughout the session, and I'll keep an eye on them and put them to Isabel as they come in after her presentation. A reminder that today's uh, event, uh, both the presentation and the Q&A are on the record. By way of context, the banking sector in Europe is uh, very important compared to the United States. It's more important for the functioning of the European economy than the American economy. Uh, companies use bank financing more than capital markets financing in Europe. Uh, households put more of their savings into banks than uh, in the United States, where other forms of savings products are more, uh, are more uh, prevalent. That means that banks in Europe, in most countries, are considerably bigger relative to our economies than in the United States and indeed many other advanced economies. This makes the uh, regulation, the functioning of the banking system particularly important for, for our continent. And as we see, when, as we saw uh, in 2008, when things go wrong with the banking system, the implications for the a uh, wider economy for people's livelihoods, for people's general well-being is, is enormous. Um, so in that context, uh, banking has always been a, a highly regulated business and uh, has been more so in, in recent years since the financial crisis. And uh, Isabel is, is central to that in her role with the, uh, the European Banking Authority. So uh, for quick formal introduction, Isabel is, re is responsible for delivering the EBA's prudential and res resolution policy work, as well as overseeing the implementation of the standards of, of, of standards with a view to ensuring a harmonized set of supervisory and re resolution approaches across the EU. From 20, 2011 until 2018, she was responsible for the EBA regulatory framework. Uh, prior to that, that, that appointment, Isabel was head, head inspector for on-site examinations at the French Financial Markets Authority. And prior to that, uh, she was Deputy Director of the European International Relations Department uh, at the uh, of the European Regular. Sorry. Okay, good. So without further ado, uh, Isabel, and your many, uh, your hugely wide experience, we look forward to your, um, to your opening remarks. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for your introduction and kind words. Uh, so I'm very happy to discuss with you today the post-crisis regulatory reforms and uh, from my perspective, the need to push for completion. So uh, I would first like to thank the Institute uh, for, of International and European Affairs for inviting me to discuss uh, this topic. Um, I must say that uh, I remember I have been with you, I think, more or less seven years ago. That obviously was in a very different setting, uh, in a room close to the harbor. So something very uh, dear to my memory indeed. And I wish uh, we can reconvene uh, more physically in another, in another time. But as we meet today in this virtual and sometimes even more effective manner, I'm very happy to uh, first uh, well highlight that I sincerely hope that we are at the beginning of the end of the most traumatic uh, health crisis uh, that any of us will have seen in our lifetime. And <clears throat> at the same time, uh, well, we take comfort and encouragement from the resilience of uh, our frontline workers uh, in Ireland, I'm sure, and all across the union. Uh, the professionalism of whom, uh, well, uh, deal with this enormous and unprecedented challenge. Uh, I would say from the more narrow corner of uh, my remit, uh, I think we can also take comfort of the uh, contribution and uh, 
resilience of the banks uh, in this period of time. Uh, while there are clear differences, uh, the magnitude of the challenges that we now face will uh, undoubtedly evoke the memories of the old financial world crisis in 2008. And um, I think it's my duty to uh, exchange with uh, most of you uh, to make sure that the broadly held beliefs uh, in how the system operated and that were torn apart at the time, now, uh, well, uh, offer much better resilience. Uh, so indeed, uh, the events that were set in motion a decade, a decade long uh, process for the reform has now transformed, in my view, our approach to the regulation, as well as the supervision and resolution of banks. I think also uh, you would concur with me that these measures uh, have uh, are now showing their values. Uh, and it is uh, all the more important to acknowledge that the process is not yet complete. And in my view, the COVID-19 has the potential uh, to uh, generate further stress, obviously. Uh, we are not yet there at the peak, at least of the economic and financial crisis. But it is also a window of, of opportunity for us to use uh, so as to push the completion of the reforms, which will, in the end, deliver their full value. So th this is with this in mind that I would uh, like to uh, take, say, 10 or 15 minutes for, for discussing with you and presenting my views. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, uh, much has been written over the years about the origin and causes of the global crisis. Uh, it is now clear that there were also many contributory factors. Of course, we remember the uh, low inflation, stable growth, uh, which have widely held belief that we were in a period of great moderation, we call it at the time, where factors such as structural changes in the economy, improvements in the understanding of the monetary policy, well, gave rise to some certainty and maybe uh, too high comforts. Um, rather, it, it also gave rise to a period of excessive risk-taking, we know, coupled with innovations in uh, financial markets. And it meant that financial stability risk were not clearly understood. I would make kind of analogy. It's a bit hazardous analogy, but what I see is that we may be in some manner going through a similar thing we know that there are many, many innovations, there are multiple, uh, and they have been accelerated during this crisis, probably for the good. But on the other hand, risks are even more difficult to evaluate uh, uh, with the high uncertainties that we are going through. And that's why we definitely need to consolidate the structural framework that we have been building. Uh, one other aspect of the reform that we, we conducted also show that it is clear that the system of regulation governing banks had become, at the time, far too relaxed compared to the condition that we went through. We know that poor governance uh, had seen banks pursuing high short-term uh, financial targets, probably at the expense of prudent long-term strategies, for instance, or capital, both in quality and quantity, had been reduced rather thin that facilitated excessive leverage. Um, so this picture, uh, on the contrary, seemed to resound very um, strikingly different than uh, from the time that we are now in. Uh, so given the reforms, at least a, a shift from the prudential side in particular, uh, we can expect to be on much better ground. Finally, in this uh, aspect, uh, I would also highlight that uh, there was chaos at the time, uh, which uh, exposed the absence of proper crisis management procedures. Uh, at the time, there were hardly some technical directives uh, able to deal with some aspect of the failure of the banks. Nothing to compare with the, uh, with the complexity of the resolution of uh, the financial system that we had to go through. And this is where we experienced the full complexity of this resolution process. 
that in the end uh, we could understand better and led to a more holistic uh, framework develop. But this is where probably, um, despite the end result being um, the losses incurred by banks were, say, socialized, uh, the legislators uh, went back to the drawing board, fundamentally recast the regime, uh, and some key missing parts of this uh, of this regime are still uh, to be agreed. So. This is what I take of the you know, need for the reform that we uh, uh, followed suit, basically. So there has been indeed a decade of strengthening. I would claim, I would claim that the benefits of this strengthening uh, has, up to now, helped us navigating this pandemic crisis. Uh, so at the EBA, uh, as part of the uh, European financial uh, system of uh, financial supervision, uh, we are very much keen on um, uh, supporting the, the final development of this decade of strengthening. Uh, our structure has, has seen a shift away from national regulation and the introduction of a standardized approach uh, for the oversight of the financial sector. In terms of prudential uh, framework, I think everybody will agree um, the situation has changed substantially on capital, for instance. Uh, just before the pandemic, uh, the average common equity tier one uh, was around 14, 14%, so nothing to compare with the 9% of 2009 approximately. And even at the end of 2020, uh, this capital ratio reached uh, more than 15%. So uh, this regulatory regime has indeed added uh, the buffers requirements uh, that probably were needed. We know various forms, the systemic risk buffer, the cancer cyclical buffer, the conservation buffer, maybe a lot of them, and we can discuss this point. But <clears throat> in my view, very importantly, this is this buffer function that has allowed the authorities to apply the flexibility uh, that was needed uh, at the time the pandemic struck. Uh, so we must uh, have, uh, uh, well, we must conserve, we must continue with this uh, buff crash function one way or another, even if we would, I would like to simplify it, but okay. Uh, the same applies with the liquidity buffers. We can discuss why, why they are so high. As a matter of fact, in Europe, we know it's more than 170, something like that uh, right now. So much above the 100% requirement. So there is something to look into that obviously, but again, uh, this is why I think we can say, uh, hopefully anticipate that the crisis, uh, when it will uh, fully blow up, uh, will not fail banks because of liquidity absence. Uh, a bit more difficult in the crisis management uh, area, of course, the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, the BRD, uh, which came into effect in uh, 17, in uh, 15, sorry, uh, has it now established a, a modern uh, framework in the EU for dealing with failing or likely to fail banks. All the jurisdictions have competent authority dedicated to the resolution, uh, dealing with the planning of the failure of banks and the execution also of such uh, plans. At the EBA, we are extremely attentive and uh, very active uh, to make such plans realistic as well as operative. We still have some progress on the operation of sites to make here. But again, <clears throat> uh, against this crisis of uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, we can make sure that uh, the banks uh, are much more, are much better equipped, be it for handling idiosyncratic or uh, at European level for systemic failures. So I think um, we, we have taken comfort of this uh, up to say this very first year of the crisis. Probably the efficacy of the measures uh, can be discussed. It's, it's difficult to compare obviously to the previous crisis, uh, but if we take the a contrario reasoning, <laughs> should have we had uh, the thin capital buffers of the time or the, the weak liquidity of the time, 
probably we could not have even uh, gone through this first year as we have been. So uh, the cancer cyclicality abilities are there. They have smoothed this first year of the crisis. There is still some uh, well, uh, ability to use. And uh, this is where uh, I, I would like to come uh, in the first part of my inter uh, intervention to you. <clears throat> so uh, what remains to be done, uh, probably I would like to highlight a few musts. Um, Certainly, there is no room for complacency. Uh, the government supports have been deployed uh, over the last years, and we know that they will fade out. Obviously, all governments try to make this uh, fading out as smooth as possible. Uh, in as much as this will occur, uh, it, will, it will probably uh, go with a, a higher level of non-performing loans, which will increase. We, we have uh, not yet seen this, or, or very uh, marginally, but banks that enter the crisis with lower capital level, poor business models sometimes, or riskier exposures will definitely face challenges. So this is why it is still the time to read up all the efforts, not just manage the crisis, but complete the big picture that we had committed to and completing the goals and ambitions were so evident at the end of the previous crisis. In the banking union, uh, well, of course, there is the pressing issue, which is to deliver, which is the need to deliver the common uh, deposit insurance scheme, so the EDIS. This third, third leg, uh, much has been done, <clears throat> not, to, uh, not the least uh, the adoption of the risk reduction uh, measures package. Uh, this package, I would highlight, has um, uh, given the EBA over 100 mandates, uh, regulatory products. <laughs> so this may seem a lot. There are small and big things there, but mainly in the areas of governance, remuneration, uh, also uh, large exposure resolution, as well as disclosure, also some very important features of the improvements of the EU regulatory framework uh, are there. So the, the vast majority has already been delivered. And uh, it uh, probably helped in having quite improvements in the risk metrics that we could go through in navigating this crisis, definitely. So <clears throat> compared to these uh, big achievements, detailed achievements in the prudential regime, the third pillar now remains it just seems elusive and leaves a gap uh, clearly in the framework of the banking union. Beyond this uh, difficult file, there are some other structural gaps that could also be a source of fragility should financial stability be threatened. So one clear example I have in mind is the lack of a harmonized insolvency regime for banks in the EU. We know that there are variations in domestic insolvency requirements across the EU, and it creates situations where, say, liquidations of similar banks uh, in different jurisdictions is likely to generate dissimilar outcomes. <clears throat> so this can be due, obviously, to difference in areas such as the grounds of, for insolvency, the procedures and tools also uh, that are available but also the sources of external funding that may be available. So <clears throat> many national insolvency regimes, which normally have general application to corporate entities, are not in any manner specific to banks. And this uh, is creating a misalignment with the provisions of the BRZ. So <clears throat> probably when dealing with the situation uh, of a bank, uh, like say fail or likely to fail, uh, there is no alignment with the domestic regime for determining insolvency. We have seen uh, this case with the Latvian Bank ABLB in the past, in the recent past. And uh, there is also the need to, to close this file. Um, uh, well, for facing the big peak of the financial crisis, uh, which is yet to be seen. 
Um, maybe another area which is more easily attained, I would say, uh, the EBA is pushing for rapid progress uh, for banks to meet the targets of their minimal requirements for eligible liabilities, so the MREL, uh, be it internal MREL sometimes, uh, or, it, or also solutions to be found for dealing with small and medium-sized banks that have not been able to raise MREL. Uh, also, removing barriers for effective bail-in of debt when quoted on EU or third country exchanges, all those are more operational files that probably uh, we can enter into with less uh, political dissenting, I would say. Uh, so this is another area that we, we could, uh, well, progress and conclude uh, the plan. Another file <coughs> uh, is the one on the um, so-called doom loop or sovereign uh, bank nexus. Uh, well, it is probably well known that the EBA has always been pushing also for progress on this file with a special angle. So today we see that um, sovereign exposures of European banks well increased uh, during the last two years. Probably we'll see that uh, also for the next year to come, given the uh, public support that, that has been committed uh, to, support public, to support loans in banks. Uh, but what is important is that the diversification of banks uh, in um, holding this uh, public debt, uh, or sovereign debt more precisely, uh, is progressing very slowly, but a bit. Uh, so, again, it is right the time to push uh, also for having this more, um, well, sharing of the burden to some extent and uh, facilitate the diversification across our financial system of the handling of the public debt. So, these are, uh, so those few musts that I wanted to share with you, where I think the completion of the banking union is really needed and is still possible to do, say, uh, at least in part for this year to come, before, in my view, it is the, the full blowout uh, of the uh, crisis when it hurts the financial system. So as a conclusion, <clears throat> I may say that also Ireland, I see, has gained uh, from uh, the overhaul of the reform. Uh, I have seen also there are many uh, new uh, inflows of institutions following Brexit, uh, which in my view show that the regulatory system uh, in Ireland, uh, well, uh, in line with the EU standards, is very attractive. Uh, I suspect also high capital requirements uh, have been associated with um, um, a reduction in the number of banks uh, providing retail services, some concern I heard uh, locally. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, probably uh, some factors like um, the recovery rate on loans, uh, for instance, those practical files that I mentioned uh, are probably new areas to, to conquer for our market to be deeper, more fluid, uh, and also more single. So very uh, importantly, um, my last word will be that uh, the supports which have been provided to the economies throughout the pandemic, uh, I think nobody uh, would dispute them, but uh, I think they should be seen as a window of opportunity to complete the process and avail the full benefits and strength of the banking union as it was envisaged in 2012. Uh, it is important not to wait until this um, crisis uh, finally develops uh, and put the financial system on the cliff edge. Uh, we have been strengthening it a lot. I think uh, it helped us navigating this first year, and we still have uh, a chance to navigate well for the, say, two uh, next year to come. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> 